Well, good morning, traders. Welcome to followmetrades.com Saturday scanning session. I am Dean Jenkins, founder of followmetrades.com, and I'm glad you are here and logged in. And we're ready to go. It is eight o'clock sharp here on the West Coast. It's 11 o'clock a.m. on the East Coast of the United States. We want to get started on time, make good use of this time. But we got lots of people logging in still. And uh, good morning and welcome. You'll notice in the Zoom webinar chat, or in the Zoom webinar platform, there's a chat feature there. There's also a hand raising feature. Um, so if you look down at the controls, maybe play with that, you can raise your hand. And then also in the chat box, you can type in any questions or comments as we go. And that's really important. I wanna make this interactive. And later in the session, I'll be happy to look at any charts that you're interested in. So make sure you can, uh, make sure you can uh, locate uh, the chat feature. And Larry says, can't hear me. Uh, I think everybody else, audio is okay, the video is okay, I assume. And uh, Megan, thank you. All right, Jane, calling from Austria, outstanding. So as, as part of locating that chat feature, go ahead and type in where you're calling from. What uh, city, state, country, it's always fun to see. Hey, Paul's calling from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Megan's from Canada, Michigan. Going too fast, Washington, Florida, Boston, Squim, hey, no, neighbors, UK, Monterey, Houston, Hong Kong, nice, Tulsa, Houston, Portland, Oregon, Chris, just down the road from me. I'm in Olympia, Washington, just south of Seattle. John's calling in from Seattle, Robert from Sweden, we got Gavin from Johannesburg, nice. Man, we got South America, we got uh, Europe covered. And we've got Michigan, Alan. <laughs> All right, good morning. Texas, New Mexico, Los Angeles. Very good. It looks like more people are still logging in. Well, let's go ahead and get started. You guys are here on time, and I, again, want to make good use of this time. So let's go ahead and press on with the, uh, the session here. Uh, real quick, before we get started, it's important. Hey, everything presented in this session is for education and information purposes only. I'm a trader. I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not giving financial advice. I'm going to be scanning for trades that meet my criteria. I'll even show you a couple of trades that I'm currently in as good examples. I'll analyze uh, uh, symbols that you're interested in as well. And I'll offer my opinion uh, using my analysis techniques. But um, I'm not giving financial advice. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing what I do, the techniques I use, trades I'm looking at, whether any, anybody takes a takes a trade, um, gets involved in the market, strictly decision of each person, only you know what's appropriate for you, for your, uh, you know, your account size, your risk tolerance, all the factors that go into that. So I share what I do. Each person makes their own decision. The, the information's for education and information purposes. All right, so I know there's some folks who were invited here by some of my uh, friends. So you may not know much about me, so I'll just do a real quick introduction. So I'm, I'm Dean Jenkins, I'm the founder of followmetrades.com. Hey, hey, Bernard, you're welcome. Thank you for showing up. Um, so I've been investing and trading for more than 20 years, pushing 30 years, actually. It, it really started when I, I joined um, Intel Corporation in, in 1993. And as part of our benefits package, we got offered uh, an employee stock purchase and incentive stock options. And that was really just as the dot-com boom was taken off, uh, Intel participated in that. and you know, the, the options and the shares that I got in Intel, you know, just, just did that. It was amazing. It doubled and split like clockwork every two years. And so that certainly got my interest in the potential in the, the stock market. Um, during that time, I got the MBA from the University of Washington, learned how to do a financial analysis. So for quite a while, I was a fundamental trader, you know, using the tools I had learned in business school. And it just seemed to make sense. It, it, it seemed so logical, right? You, you analyze a company and it's got good, good solid financials and it's got earnings growth and a, and a great management team and great products. The thing should just march up like, like Intel did, right? Um, it just seemed to make sense. And then as many of you know, um, it doesn't always do that, does it? And, and conversely, if there was bad news about a company, it was a lousy company and they were fumbling, you'd expect the thing to go down. Um, but it doesn't always. And, and what it turns out is there's quite a bit of emotion and, in the market. And um, 
And so maybe when their company has good news, it wasn't as good as the market expected. And when they have bad news, it wasn't as bad as people expected. And so over the long term, you know, fundamentals matter. Um, earnings ultimately matter. Uh, Benjamin Graham, who is kind of the father of value investing, a big influence on Warren Buffett, he said, you know, in the long term, the, the market is a weighing machine, weighing earnings. And over the long term, you know, solid earnings growth will result in a higher share price. But in the short term, it's a voting machine. And short term, you know, I think of as less than maybe a year or two time frame. So the market votes based on emotion and perception uh, about what's going on with the company. And, and what I've learned as I transitioned from a fundamental trader to a technical trader was there's a pattern and that plays out on stock charts. And you can see the market's emotion and shifts in emotions using technical analysis, and it's really powerful. So um, I ultimately you know, got mixed results as a fundamental trader. Uh, it was frustrating because the market didn't do what I thought it should do. And so uh, I totally gave up on the market for a couple of years. In 2007, I pulled all my money out, went to cash, and it wasn't because I was a, a, you know, some kind of um, seer and, and, and could see the future. I just got lucky. I got out in 2007. Um, before the market really tanked. That was really good news. But I couldn't stay out. The market's just too compelling. And I just knew there had to be a way to be successful. So after 2009, I got back in and I was in some winning trades. I bought Bank of America at like five bucks and it went to 12. But what I found out was, um, I was and I bought the British Petroleum as well and it went up. Um, but I was in winning trades, but it's still stressful. Um, you know, being in a winning trade can be just as stressful as a losing trade if you don't have a plan. Um, cause you know, here's the thing goes from five bucks, to 12 bucks. And then you, you know, it's like a nail biter. Should, you know, should I go ahead and take my profit or is it going to double from here? And I'm going to miss out on it. Or am I going to give my profit away? And, and that just causes stress and anxiety. And, and so about 2010, I got really interested in technical trading. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, I, I bought lots of blinking light, cool looking indicators and, and took various training courses that went down, um, some dead ends. But I, I finally found, you know, a system that works for me. I found a really good mentor, Bennett McDowell of TradersCoach.com, and, and finally got together, you know, got on track and got a solid uh, trading system that works. About 2012, I settled down on my current trading system and I started getting consistent results. And that was really, really satisfying. And so you can see on my website, FollowMeTrades.com, I published my trades um, back for about the last four or five years. And in 2015, I launched uh, followingtrades.com. It's a, it's a, I have, offer a, uh, a stock advisory service. So simply the trades I'm taking in my own account, I let you know the trades I'm taking. Um, and you can follow along. That's the name of the company, Following Trades. You can follow along with my trades, which have been consistently profitable. I also run a, a live trading room in the morning and have some uh, education and mentoring programs. Megan, you did, uh, you did Bank of America too. Yeah, it was, it was nice, right? But still stressful without a plan. All right, so that's, that's just a little bit about me. Um, stay with me during this session because I'm going to be looking for trade setups. We're going to go pretty fast. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain the setups I'm looking for, and then I'm going to actually go apply them and, and use some scanning techniques to narrow a large list of stocks down to a, a manageable list, and we're going to see if there's any good setups there. Um, and then I'll look at anything you're interested in. So. I may love some of your ideas. Some of my best trades come, you know, from sessions just like this where someone says, hey, go look at ABC. And I look at it, go, oh, good setup, man, yeah, make a note. So, um, uh, so stay with me if you want to get the most out of this. If you're multitasking, you might miss some really valuable information. So I'll try to keep it interesting and uh, keep your attention here. Uh, but, you know, interact, make, ask questions, make comments as we go. You're absolutely welcome to do that. You know, I mentioned my website, my trading resume. You know, if, if, if you're going to listen to me, um, probably makes sense to tell you whether I've gotten any results or not. And here we are. I'm listing my results on my website from 2013 through uh, this year to date. Always beat the indexes. When they're going up, you know, we go up a little bit higher. When they go down, we still do great. So uh, year on year, we've got a really great average. Um, and, you know, it's one thing just to put them in a table here. You can go look at the details on these green buttons of every single trade. So for 2017, I list every single trade I took whether it was a winner or a loser, you know, what the date was, how long I was in it, what I got in at, what I got out of that. So I believe in complete transparency. Um, so there's the details of every trade I've, I took that's listed here on the website. And 
Um, again, transparency, I, I believe it's important. And what I do is have a, a third party accounting firm audit. Whatever I put on my website, I started this about a year ago. When I post results on my website, every quarter, um, we have an external CPA firm who then um, comes and audits it. And I give them my brokerage statements and they, uh, they check and see whether I actually did what I said I did. And that's available for you, potential customer, to check out. Okay, so that's my resume. And ultimately, it's about my results, right? Okay, here, to be a consistently profitable trader, and this is what I learned as I turned the quarter from corner from inconsistent results and frustration and stress to having fun making consistent <laughs> profits, I learned there is essentially three things that you've got to have to be a consistently profitable trader. And the first thing, you've got to have great trade setups. Now, I've got trade setups that I use. Mine aren't the only ones on the world, they're just the best ones. Um, but other people use other indicators, other trade setups, right? But you gotta have a consistent trade setup that gives you an edge in the market, right? That makes you win more than you lose. <laughs> you gotta have a consistent trade setup. You gotta have a high probability outcome, and you gotta have a great reward to risk ratio. There's many trading systems out there that can, that can book winners, but the problem with them is, for me, is that they have a poor reward to risk ratio. You, know, you get five winners in a row, and then a loser comes along and it takes it all back. That's not a good system for me. I don't like that. I want the, uh, my, my tagline is, you know, keep your winners big and your losers small. And those statistics are super important. So you've got to have a great reward to risk ratio. You've got to have risk management. You've got to control the downside. You know, the first question for me on any given trade is, how much could I lose? Right? And I control that through... Uh, Position size management, stop management. And then once you're in a trade, you got to have a way to manage it so you're not stressed out. Um, and so you can maximize profit. And you have a set of black and white trading rules that you can follow once you're in a trade. You know, how do you, how do you move your stop? Where do you take profit? Where do you exit? So you got to have great trading management. You got to have all three of those things in a trading system, I believe, to be consistently profitable. Um, let's talk about casinos. <laughs> Right, here's some people having fun. They're at the craps table, rolling the dice. Looks like they must be on a winning streak. Uh, they're all smiling. They got their drinks in their hands, right? They're having fun. But uh, uh, these people are gambling. Are the casino ga owners gambling? Absolutely not. Because they, the casino owners, are upstairs um, with green eye shades on and looking in the cameras and, and watching over stuff. And, and they're not gambling, right? They're running a business and they are, um, they absolutely ensure control of two variables, probability and risk. And uh, uh, Gavin says, hey Dean, Fibonacci is a sure trade setup. Is that part of your, I absolutely use Fibonacci levels. Yes, and we're gonna get into my setups in just a minute. Um, so think about roulette, it seems so simple. You got numbers one through 36, half the numbers are black, half are red. So you got even odds, 50-50 chance every, you know, that any given spin is gonna be 50-50, it's red or black or even odd. So it's got a one-to-one -one payout. If you bet 10 bucks, you win, you get 20 bucks. Right, but you look at this, you go, wait, here, here's this roulette wheel. What's up with these green spots, right? You got zero, zero, zero and double zero, they're green spots. And what they do, uh, zero and double zero, change the odds from 50-50 to 47.5 uh, probability win for the player per spin. So that's 52.5 probability of a win for the owners of the casino, and guess what? That's enough. The casino makes all their profit on the roulette wheel on that 2.5% edge, because they know over thousands of spins, they're gonna win 52.5% of the time, and that is absolutely enough. And they, so they, they control probability by putting those, those darn green spots in. They, they tilt it just a little bit their way, and then they control risk by um, table limit. They say, hey, the most you can bet on, at the roulette table in a given pit is you know, maybe it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, something like that. You can't go in and put a million dollars on the black spot um, because if you win, that would be, uh, uh, they would not, it would be too big of a hit for them. So they don't allow it. Right? They, they control loss and they control probability. And because of that, they're consistently profitable. Right? So why not be the house? You know, don't, don't be the gambler on the floor. Be the house right? by doing those exact two same things, by putting probability on your side, having an edge in your trading through your, through your trade setups, and controlling risk. 
so your reward to risk payout and your uh, any any control of loss on your given trade. So that's a, a fun example. Just as we start talking about trade setups and trading in general, I think it's fun to to bring those concepts of having a great trade setup, having risk management, trade management, to use this example of it. Okay, so I said you need great trade setups. Um, and I'm gonna walk through what my trade setups are. Okay, so I use, I use three major uh, techniques in my, in my chart analysis. The first one is uh, Ichimoku Cloud. So I use Ichimoku Cloud. I know a lot of people like moving averages Ichimoku Cloud is similar to moving averages, but but different and uh, and a little bit better. Okay, in in my opinion, and it's and it's proven out over time. Let me get my thing right here. So this is what the Ichimoku Cloud looks like uh, on on a chart. This is my platform, my trade station, that I'm using. The key thing that I'm concerned with with Ichimoku Cloud is the shaded area. It's green. When the trend is going up, it's red and it's going down. This is a projected support and resistance area. And it's very similar to um, moving averages. I know a lot of people use the 8, the 20, the 50, the 200, 100, whatever. So the Ichimoku cloud, uh, moving averages are simply calculated by taking the average closing price for a simple moving average. It's the average closing price looking back X number of bars. So for a 200, period, simple moving average, it takes the average of the closing price for the last 200 periods, uh, or price bars. Uh, Ichimoku Cloud looks back, whatever you set it at, you know, 10, 20, 50, 200, but it takes the average of the highest high and the highest low. I think that's a better number than the closing price because price actually moved to a high and to a low. So by taking the average of true price movement, I think we get a more accurate depiction. And then and it, you know, it uses a fast one and a slow one you know, just like you would a 50 or 200, right? So you get crossovers, and then it shades the area between those moving lines. And it, in, the, in Japanese, that's called kumo, it's cloud. And what that does is pro project or predict a support area. And you can see it's predicted out into the future, which no moving average does, so that's pretty cool. And you can see in an uptrend, it, it, it really does show, you know, where in an, in an uptrend, it price comes down to that support area, but then continues, right? And we're going to talk about Dow theory in a minute. And when, when price breaks through the cloud, it's pretty powerful. When it changes directions, either it's channeling or breaks above or, you know, it breaks down below, that can be a, a powerful signal of a change in trend. So pretty interesting. Yeah, my cloud settings are totally different than default. And um, I, I do offer a, a, a short, pretty inexpensive course where I talk about the whole approach, you know, a comprehensive approach to using the, uh, the HMOCA cloud. Uh, I don't use uh, the, a lot of the, I don't use the Chiku line and, and uh, some of the other traditional approaches. I'm strictly looking at it as a trend confirming and resistance and support predicting indicator. Okay, and you can see again it predicts pretty accurately what the support levels are going to be, and you can see this is painted out into the future based on prior uh, price movement. So it's pretty cool. So I use Ichimoku Cloud to confirm trend beginning, trend ending, and support and resistance areas. I use Elliott Wave as a, this is really the core of my analysis. So uh, interesting, Ralph Nelson Elliott developed the Elliott Wave theory back in the 1930s. That was the same time that uh, Goichi Hisada was working on Ichimoku Cloud in Japan. Um, and uh, I use them together, I call it East meets West, right? So each uh, Elliott Wave it just says, that there's a collective investor psychology of pessimism or optimism. And I talked about that when I said how frustrating uh, fundamental trading can be. And Benjamin Graham saying in the short term, the market is a voting machine. And it absolutely is. And, and people vote, you know, in terms of uh, uh, pop optimism and then in, in terms of pessimism. And it runs in natural sequences, it turns out. Waves, impulsive and cor corrective waves. And there's probably some people listening who are rolling their eyes at this moment, going, oh, Elliott Wave, I've looked at that, it's too complex, right? I, I would have to agree with you with the typical approach to Elliott Wave. So I have a very simple, absolutely simple, you know, a kindergartner can draw it with a crayon on your freshly painted wall. Um, <laughs> the approach that I use to Elliott Wave, and it's very repeatable. Um, uh, I like to say, uh, I didn't write the book on, on a simple approach to Elliott Wave, but I helped. Uh, Bennett McDowell, my mentor, the founder of uh, 
um, uh, traderscoach.com, released a book about two years ago called Elliott Wave, Te Elliott Wave Techniques Simplified, and he invited me to write a chapter in that book, and I did, and I was honored to do that. So Bennett taught me, I teach other people, I use it, a simple, repeatable approach to Elliott Wave Theory. If you look at this uh, idealized pattern, what we care about here is, you see this, this wave labeled three. This is a big impulsive move, and what we know from history, from just studying charts, thousands and thousands of charts, is after you get a big move, uh, there's a correction, uh, nearly always. You know, there's, there's no certainties in the market, but there are certainly probabilities. After a big impulsive move, there is a high probability that at some point it's going to correct. And it turns out it corrects to Fibonacci levels. Interesting, right? That gives you a zone, a price target, which is a powerful tool because then we can calculate reward to risk on the trade if we've got a price target, right? So we know we get an impulsive move, we get a correction, and then we get another impulsive move. There's an ABC afterwards. Um, there's a start of a trend, and I'll talk about Dow theory in a minute, but all we really care about is the impulsive move, the correction, and the continuation. Three waves. I only got three trade setups. Right? I'm trying to catch a new trend. After a big move, I'm trying to catch a correction. After the correction, I'm trying to catch a continuation. That's all. Works exactly the same way and opposite for a bearish trade. And, and these are easy to spot. And all these grand cycles and super cycles and forget all that. Forget it. This is all we need. Three waves. All right? I use Dow Theory. Dow Theory is a powerful uh, tool. This is a portion of it. You know, Charles Dow, back in the late 1800s, published a series of articles in the New York Times um, that are now compiled into a book on Dow Theory. But one of the things he said was, hey, an uptrend is defined by a series of higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. Um, seems simple enough, but it's important, right? Because when we're in a trend, like when I was in Bank of America, freaking out, not knowing if the trend was over yet, uh, Elliott Wave works on any time frame, right? What's really interesting is price patterns are fractal, meaning you have the exact same patterns at any level of magnification. So it absolutely works on intraday time frames. Yep. Uh, so higher highs, higher lows, because we're in an uptrend, it doesn't go straight up. If you notice that, it's really frustrating, you know? Uh, so price goes up, pulls back, goes up, pulls back. What's important, though, when it pulls back is that it doesn't go below previous lows, and then when it goes up, it goes up to new highs. As long as that happens, we're in an uptrend. Downtrend, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs. As long as that pattern continues, we're still in a downtrend. When does it end? When the pattern gets broken. When we don't put in a new high, and when the price goes below a previous low. Uh-oh, uptrend over. We can also use it to, to uh, look for the beginning of a trend. We got a high, higher low, new high. Hmm, trend began. Same thing over here. And by the way, the beginning of a downtrend looks just like the end of an uptrend. Well, that seems important. As traders, we want to know, has a trend begun? Has it ended? Has a corrective trend begun? Has it ended? So I use Ichimoku Cloud, Elliott Wave, Dow Theory. Uh, those are the three theories that underlie my analysis technique. And I use some indicators to help with it. I use um, Ichimoku Cloud, of course, as an indicator. I use the 200 uh, moving average on daily charts um, because that's the most popular indicator on the planet and everybody else is looking at it, so I probably wanna know where it's at. And I use a price oscillator for momentum to confirm that a price, uh, a trend has changed. Okay. And we're gonna apply that to some charts here real soon. Um, so I talked about great trade setups and I'll demonstrate my setups using those concepts, those techniques here in just a minute. Uh, risk management, you gotta control loss. And um, you, I think it's essential. I think I can make a definitive statement. You, go, you must, you must determine how much you're willing to lose on a trade. Now we don't wanna lose money on any given trade, but we, we, we should accept the reality that any trade can fail. And then we, if that's true, then we must determine how much we're willing to lose on a trade. And it has to be a pain-free level, an amount that will not you know, set you back and drain your account. I use 2%. So 2% is not how much of my tr trading capital is tied up in a trade. It's how much would I lose if the trade fails. So I determine my stop loss level first using Dow Theory. Oops. Here. So I put my stops 
under these higher lows in an uptrend and under these lower highs in a downtrend. So uh, I use legitimate price levels. I don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't use arbitrary levels, you know, 5% or this. I use actual price movement. So then I determine my stop loss level and then I calculate my position size by some simple arithmetic. I take the entry price minus the stop price in a long trade, gives me the risk per share. I figure out what 2% of my account is. So like, you know, $100,000 account, 2% is two grand. And I divide that loss per share to 2,000, tells me how many shares to buy. So what that means is I go take that position. If it hits the stop, I lose 2% of my account. I've controlled it. Um, I also constrain my position so that there's no more than 15% of my total account purchasing power, um, not including margin, in any given trade. I don't want to be that exposed to any given trade. Okay, you got to have trade management. So once you're in a trade, um, you got to have a way to manage it: where to take profit, where to move your stop, where to get out. Right? Great, you can, have, you can have great setups, you can have great risk management, and you still lose money if you don't manage the trade appropriately. So great trade management is taking profit at the right time, adding to the position strategically, which you can do without increasing risk, staying with a winner as long as it's possible. So you'll hear me say, you know, keep your winners big, your losers small. The only way you can keep your winners big is to let them run. Everybody's heard the, you know, the trading maxim, cut your Losers short, let your winners run. You gotta do it. You gotta have big winners to tilt your PL um, in your favor. And then you gotta exit the trade at the right time when the trend has ended. And we use uh, Dow 30. When did the trend change? If it's making higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, and then lower, low, lower high, low, lower high, new low, that's when we get out. And we just let it hit the last stop. I take profit along the way, typically in thirds, and then keep trading my stop and let the final portion of the uh, position gets stopped out at the last stop. That way we stay with it for as long as possible. So here's how I trail stops from, from you know, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. I just trail it to the new higher lows. Right? We eventually get stopped out, that's great. And we come, there's, a, there's an impulsive wave. There's a corrective wave, wasn't enough profits, so we didn't take it. Here comes the next continuation. Take this trade, trail our stop, boom, boom, boom. So that's, uh, so Gavin, should each trade not be more than 2% of the total account size? No, um, it's the loss if the trade hits the stop, that amount. How much would I lose if it hits the stop? That should be no more than 2%. The, the size of the position may be 5 or 10% of my account, but the amount I lose if it fails is the 2% number. That's the magic. And if that's too big, scale it back to 1%, right? Going higher, um, you gotta be, you gotta have phenomenal trading statistics to use more than 2%. Uh-oh. It's got a little, little connection warning. Uh, everybody still good? Audio good, video good? Give me a thumbs up there, raise your Wow. Okay, there we go. Everything's back. Everything's good. Okay, whoo! Well, that freaked me out. Um, hmm. Yeah, this is totally being recorded. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, that'll get your pulse rate up a little bit. I guess it just had a little uh, internet issue. Okay. Hey, let's talk about scanning now, right? I've talked about my trade setups, my approach to trading. Yeah, I'm back. All right, let's talk about scanning. Um, what I do is I create a first a big picture review. What ultimately what I, I you know there's a universe of you know, six thousand symbols, stock symbols, and ETFs. Right, we got to narrow that down. We got to funnel that down to a particular sector and a smaller list of uh, of uh, symbols to go look at. So I've got some techniques for doing that. First thing I do is just a big picture, man. What, what is going on in the world and in the financial markets? And I create a thesis. I go, I think, I think you know, this thesis has to be proven, right? But it's a starting point. It 
it'll direct my attention somewhere. I don't trade based on what I think is happening or should happen, but I can let my thesis, my, my beliefs, lead me to an, an area to go analyze, and then I can prove and find whether there's good trades there or not. Okay, so big picture review, create a thesis, narrow the list down to a manageable one. I've got my trade setups, so I go scanning for trades. I get, I get you know, a group of symbols, um, and then I go look at the charts. Right? I have not yet found a way to automate the chart analysis. I would love it if I could, but there's a bit, you know, there's some science to it, but there's a bit of art. You gotta, you gotta recognize patterns. Um, so ultimately you gotta, um, you gotta go look at some charts. Uh, Tom says, uh, appears from my tra tra my trading record that I'm mostly doing option trades. Um, a trade's a trade, right? It, it come, a trade comes from the, the setup on the chart. And, that, and that's where everything starts, is a setup on the chart that meets my criteria. Once I have a great setup with great reward to risk ratio and a high probability outcome, a good, a good edge in it, then the decision is, how am I gonna execute the trade? Am I gonna use shares or am I gonna use options? The, the trade is derived from the pattern on the chart. The instrument used to execute the trade, um, I primarily use options. I like options. There's leverage, you can control the risk if you do it right, um, all these good things, right? And, and you tie up, le it's leverage, you tie up less capital, right? You can get outsized returns if you're right, you can control loss. But um, I publish to my subscribers, my alert service, you know, here's the details for the trade and people can trade it with shares or with options. It's, it's the same trade, it's just a different instrument to trade it with. I prefer options, and, and the results I list on the website are what I actually did in my own account. So you'll see most of them was options, okay? Very good. All right, so let's, you know, what's the big picture right now? What's, the market's, you know, been in a nine-year bull market. The indexes have done this. Uh, earlier this year, there was a little, a little uh, Warning, a little shot across the bow in early February. We were actually were short the spy at that time and had a, had a really nice trade in that. And so it looks like um, there's a bit, of a, a bit of a change going on, does it not? Let's, uh, let's look at the S&P 500 as my live chart. There is something interesting going on on the S&P 500. And here we are with you know, the indicators, the primary indicators I use. So we got S&P 500 on a daily chart. I've got the Ichimoku cloud. I've got the 200 simple moving average. And I got a price oscillator, which is showing me momentum. Try to keep it as clean as possible. So nine year bull market, there it goes up to a high. Big pullback early February. And you can see it went up to, the, it pulled back up and then went down, broke down through the cloud again. And it went down through the 200 simple moving average and it went up to the cloud. And now it found some resistance and it reversed again. This is Super interesting. Let me get a pen and draw this because you heard me talk about uh, Dow theory and we got it playing out before our eyes right here. Here's a low. Here's a lower high. Here's a new low. Here's a lower high. Right as it's hitting some resistance and reversing. So the probability is what? Next move is another low. If it does break this 200 definitively, we may have a real downtrend on our hands. That hasn't been proven yet. Um, but let's look at the weekly chart on the S&P 500 just for fun. And from the high, um, here's, here's this nine-year bull market. If it were to really start a real retracement or correction, the, Fibonacci, the, the probability is that it would go into this Fibonacci retracement zone, these two blue lines, it's 38.2 to 61.8 Fibonacci retracement. That would take us down to S&P 500 levels of 2116 to about 1642. Um, that's a big move, and I wanna be involved in that if that happens. And we're um, at a key level that will prove whether it happens or not. If it breaks with some momentum above the cloud, probably going to new highs. If it reverses and goes down below the 200 here, woo, look out. We got a big correction on our hands. That's the technical analysis of it. So given that, um, that's a kind of a big picture. What have I observed? I've observed that uh, precious metals seem to be um, heading up, just getting started into some new trends. So that's interesting. I see that uh, financials, who went up with this big trend, seem to be under pressure. Even some really big banks, JP Morgan and 
and Citigroup and Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo's got their own problems, but a handful of really big banks reported pretty good results and got punished for them. So there seems to be some pressure on financials. Maybe we want to take a look at some shorts there. And then I see some companies that did not really participate in the bull market. They actually got hammered. They were going down for whatever reason, and now they seem to be going up. You know, kind of the value play. So there's three things I would like to go act on in my scanning is uh, precious metals, uh, pressure and shorting financials, and then um, um, things that have been beaten back, the value play, we'll call it. Okay, so there's three areas to go quickly scan and see if there's any trade ideals. So I put together uh, a list of, of all precious metal companies that I could find. Uh, there's a lot. I just went through a bunch of uh, websites and articles and stuff like that. And I found all these symbols, and there's like uh, 103 of them that I found. That's a little bit unmanageable. I want to get them into my trading platform. So what I did was I imported them in here. And then I want to narrow that down some more. And what I do is I run a scan here. I use the scanning tools in uh, TradeStation. Now there's um, other... Uh, other platforms have similar functions, so I'm demonstrating it here on the platform I'm using, right? But uh, let me find what's the name of that scan that I created so I can do this. There it is, precious metal scan. And I'll show you what I did. I, uh, I, I created a symbol list of those 103 symbols uh, the, the font's kind of small, but I, I'm, I'm only looking at that 103 symbols. And then, I, and then I'm saying, what I want is the last price to be above $1.5, $1.50. I don't mind low price stocks, but I don't want penny stocks. Um, I want some good liquidity. So I said that 10 day um, average volume has got to be greater than 200,000 and that the market cap's got to be greater than 500 million. I want, you know, I don't mind a small company, but it's got to be legit, right? Got to have some liquidity. Got to be reasonably sized. So then I just run this scan, and it turns out then my list of 103 is narrowed down to 30 symbols. Well, 30 symbols I can I can manage pretty well. So I'm going to copy these symbols. Now I'm going to go over to I'm going to apply some quick indicators to these things. Paste. And what I'm doing is what I want to know is. I wrote this simple indicator here for the 200 uh, simple moving average. So I want to know if it's below or above. This isn't good. I have a little connection problem. Sorry about that. You, you guys still with me? You hear me? You see me? Okay. All we need is uh, the techno bugs here. All right. Pressing on. Um, I want to know is the price above or below the 200 moving average? How far is it from the price and how many days since the cross? Now, precious metals, we're looking for long trades, right? We think it's going up. So I'm interested in long trades on precious metal. Good enough. So I want it to be above. I want to sort for above the simple moving average and then, you know, how long since it crossed because we want to catch new trends. And then I want to confirm the HMO cloud that price is above the cloud. That would be bullish, right? So this just lets me zoom in pretty quick. And so like here, um, AUY, this is it's above the simple moving average. It's not too far above, only 5%. It's nine days since it crossed over. Trend is up. It's in the cloud. So that's interesting, AUY. So I've got this table linked to my chart. So let's go look at it. There, it's AUY. Well, right off the bat, that's a pretty interesting, uh, this thing traded 6 million shares on Friday, so that's got, uh, this is Yamada Gold. So this is interesting, not great, but interesting. Here's our impulsive move, here's a correction. It was a little too deep, so that's not actually a way forward. Um, so this could be a new trend forming. There's a high, high or low, new high. This one's kind of stuck in the cloud. So this one, not the best, it's okay. Yeah, Bruce, I'm going to email a recording to uh, everybody, assuming it works, right? Assuming it, it works with the little glitches we had, but uh, I think it is. I still got a, a good solid red light here for the record button. 
Okay, so AUI, not the best. Let's go back to our, uh, our list. What else we got? BHP, that, that crossed a long time ago. CDE, that looks good. Now this is what we like, right here. That right there is a setup. Why do I say that? Here's an impulsive move. Here's a perfect correction, and I'm gonna show you, it went to the, uh, um, into the Fibonacci retracement zone. That's been channeling in a, in a bit of this continuation, but now something new is happening, right? It's got a high, higher low, new high, as it pops above, definitively above, the 200 moving average and the Ichimoku cloud. And let's look, let's use our Fibonacci tools. So here's the Fibonacci retracement that we expected. And oh, look, it went right into there between those two blue lines. And now Fibonacci extension, where do we think the continuation will go? Up above 15 bucks, See that green line, that's the target. So this one, this one looks pretty good. And we would put our stop, like I talked about, under this last low. We would take an entry here. And our target would be at the bottom of this zone, being conservative. So look at this distance. The distance from the entry to the target versus the entry to the stop. This is our reward to risk ratio. It's so hard to draw on the mouse. Reward to risk. And look at this one, it's five or six to one. The potential um, profit on this is much, if we use the correct formula for position sizing, right? Um, if we win, we're gonna win really big on this one. And this is a nice setup. And it, and it traded at 2.2 million shares on Friday, so it's well above the average. I bet it's got a, uh, a good viable options market. So there's, we found a pretty decent looking trade uh, without too much effort. Um, just by creating a big picture, a thesis, narrowing the list down, scanning a few charts. So, yeah, I would uh, I would be interested in this one's eight seventy five right now is current price. So um, shares aren't too expensive. You could trade it with shares. I, I like options for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, you, you leverage your capital. You can control risk, right? So. Uh, I would I would go see if there's good a good viable option market and see um, you know if, if there was a good contract and that would be my first choice. If not, you know, you trade with shares, type a little more capital. But this looks good. Let me write this one down. CDE. So that's a nice long. So let's look at a different sector. There was some more on that list, <clears throat> and, and uh, I'll definitely continue to uh, to try and mine the precious metal list for good trade setups, but I wanted to demonstrate that for you. <clears throat> it's interesting that WPM showed up here, uh, wheat and precious metals. I'm, I'm happy that it showed up in my scan because um, we actually took a position on that late last week. It's a very similar setup. We got in here at uh, 2117, we got a target at 2941, and we're moving up in the end of profit already, so that's pretty fun, pretty cool. Uh, Let's let's look at it. Let's take another thesis. I talked about the financial sector, right? Uh, let's get rid of a uh, precious metal. Earnings four twenty five on CDE, so that would be a uh, we would wait to get through earnings. So and that's part of my check, Don, before I, I get in. Uh, Ray, how far out do I take option trades? I got to be at least ninety days out. I take a high high delta, deep in the money, at least ninety days out. Um, my trades last on average from four to six weeks. I want to be out of the trade, out of the contract before we get into the last three days. A lot of people, um, well, you see a lot of material about, you know, never buy options and buy option buyers lose money. Um, yeah, if you do it wrong, if you're, if you're kind of dumb in your approach to it, but if you go high delta, deep in the money, far out in time, um, time decay is not an issue and implied volatility isn't that big of an issue because most of the value of the contract is intrinsic because you're deep in the money. If you don't know those terms, it's okay. Um, but there's a strategy to how I trade options um, that works pretty well. Making a note here on that CDE. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's look at the financial sector. I do have a list of uh, 
of financial sector ones that I uh, put together before, kind of like I did the uh, um, uh, precious metal. So there's my financials list. Amir, yeah, I buy deep in the money, deep in the money. Yes, you pay more for it. And I have a whole webinar where I talk about how um, cheap options can be really expensive. There's some key values you want to pay attention to. You want to have plenty of time, you want to have a high delta, right? And then I have a method for narrowing that down to picking the best contract. Yeah, Megan, yeah, about a, a, a delta of, I, I like it to be at least 70, preferably up into the 80s. Yep. All right, here's a bunch of financials. Now we're looking at uh, potential shorts. So let's see here, we want it below the uh, moving average. We want it pretty recent and like, and also below the each local cloud. So here's CATY, never heard of it. Let's see if there's an interesting chart here. That is a pretty uh, sloppy choppy chart, isn't it? It is down below there, but that's a little too volatile for, for my taste. So what do we got? CBOE, well that's interesting. So that, um, obviously I've looked at it before, I've got some analysis on this. This is. This was a pretty good short, but it's already in the retracement zone, so it's a little late to try and go short on that one. What else we got here? We move up and want up. GWB below, down. That's a little bit thin on volume. Hope. Never heard of it. Ah. And that's, this, here's a great chart. So people are very frustrated by Elliott Wave, and they go, I just can't figure out the wave count. And you learn a chart like this, and you go, this is the kind of chart that would frustrate somebody trying to learn Elliott Wave, because there is no pattern. There is no wave count. It's a mess. You see a mess like this, you just want to run. There's, somewhere else, no, there's plenty of other charts. I don't need to sit there in anguish over. You know, I think a mistake traders make is trying to, you know, how should I trade this chart? And for me, the first question is, should I trade this chart? And one might hope. No. Run. ISPC. A lot of these look the same. They're kind of bad looking charts. There's IVZ. Um, we actually, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, Okay, there we go. <laughs> IVZ. Um, I we actually just wrapped up a trade on that. We were short on IVZ and uh, had a nice little winner. I got short 3314, got out at 3151 to profit down here at the bottom. That was pretty cool. Uh, I'm not finding any good trades. So again, this is a thesis. And uh, sometimes it's proven. Sometimes you know the precious metal ones. It's like, man, that was good. Found a couple right off the bat. Off the bat. Look at these. These are just sloppy, bad charts. Um, interesting. So that scan didn't work out so well, did it? Um, there is a. We are short uh, a financial. See how see how ordered this is. Look at. Look at how this moves in this big impulsive thing. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, start to reverse very orderly compared to our, uh, our Bank of the Ozarks, which was here. What a mess this thing is. Chris, um, I only buy options. I do not sell options. There's a place for it. I'm not opposed to it. Um, I know in directional trades, a lot of people like spreads. I don't like spreads. Um, for my style of trading because your profit is absolutely capped at the credit you get up first, up front. And if it really goes against you, you're, you could lose a lot, right? They, they have the appearance of protection, um, but if it really goes sideways, um, you, could, you, you could lose a lot. So by buying options, um, um, if you control your position size, right, the amount of money you can lose is absolutely fixed. And the amount you can make is really big. Yeah, Bruce, it is. As long as you registered, you're going to get a, an email um, uh, with a recording. 
in a couple hours when it all renders and is ready. So anyway, Ozark, what a what a messy chart, huh? It's just, just it's just erratic as compared to Citibank, which is a very orderly chart, and we just went low, short, because look at these low, lower, high, low, lower, high, boom, 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 looking great. So we're short Citibank um, right now, and we expect it to get into this correction zone between 38.2 and 61.8 Fibonacci retracement. So very very cool. I had one other thesis, and that was the dogs, right? The value play, things that have been beaten down and now maybe are coming up. And what I'm interested in is GE. You know, so GE obviously has been beaten down. And as a fundamental investor, you may shudder. But we're I'm a technical trader, and I go, I'm looking for a pattern. After this massive sell-off, I am looking for a pattern that shows that it has ended and sentiment has changed. The, the fundamentals and financials of the company may not change. That's okay. There could be a substantial short covering rally or value people trying to jump on the train here earlier, whatever reason, right, that this thing could jump up into a, into a uh, pretty meaningful um, corrective move up. Now, we've had... You know, all along the thing, there's little signs like, oh, is it happening now? Is it happening now? No, no, no. So this could be one of those fake outs. What we're looking for, if you remember Dow Theory, I want to see a high, a higher low. I want to see it not put in new lows and do this. It has never done that in this move down. This has all been lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, right? It, it is all, it has never done this. If it does that, that could be super good. That could indicate a shift in trend. And if it does it, we could be looking at a correction up into uh, $20 to about $25. If I can get into this thing, you know, about 16 bucks, up to 20, I, I, I like that. So that's a, that's a, a, a a value dogs of the indexes kind of play there. Um, and I have a, a scan that helped me find that, but I, I wanted to kind of be efficient with time here because I want to um, take a look at some of your trades. Uh, I, I promised that up front. So this would be the time. If you would like me to analyze, uh, Amir, do I wait? That, that's a good question. Do I wait above the cloud? I probably would. I would not wait for the 200. I, I uh, I don't, I don't base my entries on any one indicator that would qualify or disqualify it. It's the, it's the entirety of all the data, right? So we got, a, we got a good Elliott wave pattern here with the expectation of a correction. I, I watched the um, momentum indicator down here and get it scaled for this chart. And you can see it just went green. It just went green. I got the Ichimoku cloud, right? I got Dow Theory. I layer all those things together to try to build a case and see if it's a strong case for what's going to happen next. Okay. All right, man, you guys flooded me. So first solar. Um, let's, let's try to catch up. And, you know, don't be offended, please. FSLR. If I don't like your trade, I, I have a very specific um, trade setup criteria that I'm looking for. It may be different than yours. So, you know, if, if our setups and criteria are different, don't be surprised if our, uh, our conclusions are different. But, you know, I'm offering my analysis. First Solar actually looks great, by the way. Um, here's a wave three. This move up here. Here's a four. The correction's already happened. Here's the extension, the continuation of that original trend. Looks like we got a target up about 89 to 107. So First Solar looks absolutely great. Uh, and that was Sarandi. Outstanding. Uh, John QQQ, of course, the index ETF for the NASDAQ 100. And it looks just like the S&P 500. So we're at a critical decision point. We got this low, lower high into the cloud. If it breaks the 200, we got a bigger correction coming. It's at a decision point. It's too early. I would not go long um, and I would not go short. I would wait on the Q harmony. Peter. Yeah, um, big, big volume, 10 million shares on Friday, but this is too erratic. This is probably uh, uh, some kind of pharma, biotech, right? Um, this is not, you know, 
this was a huge move up over a few days and nearly 100% retracement. So that's not an Elliott wave pattern. This thing looks like uh, an EKG, EKG chart of, of somebody who's very ill. Um, yeah, it's erratic. It's way too erratic for me. Uh, Megan asked, we were looking in the trading room at LGIH. And uh, we are still looking at it. This is a wave five. This is, looks pretty good. Um, really kind of all systems go. We could wait for a new high here, but uh, I like it a lot. Uh, William VTVT. Uh, wow. That's another erratic one. Uh, VTV Therapeutics, probably, you know, pharma, probably had a drug test fail, um, onto new lows. It's already done its little dead cat bounce. I, I wouldn't touch that one. That's too, too messed up for me. Uh, what do I think of PM, Philip Morris? I think it's a bad idea to uh, kill your customers off with your products. I think that's a, uh, a broken business model. But in terms of the chart, um, wow, they had some bad news, didn't they? Uh, big gap down, follow through the next day. Uh, it, it, there's no good pattern here. It did put in a new low. Um, I, I don't like it. We actually traded um, another tobacco stock earlier this year and did real well on it. I'm turning the board it was. It wasn't PM, it was another one. ENPH for uh, T. Murphy. We traded that, and we were looking for a new entry, and we might have missed it. It jumped on Friday. I got an alert on that. Oh, there's still profit left. So we we traded um, this move on ENPH. We had a nice winner. It, it, and then we got stopped out, just like following my trading rules, in profit. It pulled back, and it's taken off again. The current target on ENPH is $6 to seven thirty-eight. So it uh, could be a new entry. Had this parabolic move the last couple of days, it may pull back and give us a good entry, and then we'll take a look at that again. Uh, CCL, that was a nice trade. We had fun with the MPH. CCL, I'm never going to get through all of your uh, symbols, unfortunately. It's awesome that you guys are interested. Um, uh, Caribbean Carnival, sorry. Uh, is in wave four and looks like it's getting ready to end. So it just about made the correction zone a little shallow and it's got to move up. So we would have to see follow through. The next, the next trade here is long. Um, here's this move. You want to see this, right? High, higher than new high. Break above the 200, break above the cloud, get up to about 66.85 for a new entry. Um, don't want to try and do it yet because it could continue down. We want to see evidence. You hear me use that word a lot. Evidence of the trend changing, and we don't have it yet. But if that is where it changes from, you got a pretty big target zone up there on, on the carnival. Uh, John, we did look at QQQ. Maybe you typed that after we did it. We did look at First Solar, Tom, ITT. Uh, this looks exactly like Carnival, same story. Um, big three up, four, waiting for confirmation of the next move up. You'd want to see a high, higher, low, new high. If it can get up to, you know, right here about 53.50 would be a good good entry level on uh, ITT. Volume's a little thin. And there's other criteria. you got to go check if there's any big news, earnings, or something like that coming out. Make sure the, vol the volume's good. I'm just analyzing the chart on the fly for you here. Uh, what do I think about UNG? You know, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to get a good entry on uh, natural gas. If it can break up off the bottom, above the 200, up here at about 25, uh, I'd be interested in a long on UNG, but it's not there yet. would not short it. It is finding solid support. Lex, legal case. Yeah, I've kind of compared it to that before. Preponderance of evidence. It's a great way to think about it. Right? No one individual thing but the preponderance of evidence. How strong is the case being made here? Um, Ray would like to look at Facebook. So this big drop, you know, and then uh, Zuckerberg did a reasonable job testifying before Congress. Um, it pulled back up. Look how it's hitting the cloud right now, and it's starting to slow down and find some 
resistance. We got a retracement zone that it actually made it into, but it could go deeper. If it reverses from here, I'll be looking at a short. If we get a little low, lower high, new low, I'll be looking for a short, maybe take it to the middle of that zone down to 140. I would not go long until you break the cloud up here to about 175 on Facebook. Yeah, Brent, the white line is a 200 simple moving average. Megan, uh, Citibank, I, uh, I did review that real quick here. And it's because after this long bullish run, we have a nice series of low, lower, low, lower high, new low, lower high, right? Finding resistance at the 200 at the Ichimoku cloud. We got a nice price target. We got negative momentum. So the preponderance of evidence is it's going into this correction zone on uh, Citibank. Francis, all right. All right, hey, we're at uh, nine o'clock, and I really wanna, you know, it's Saturday morning, we got, everybody's got cool stuff they wanna go do. I wanna go ahead and wrap it up pretty quick here. Ray, how does earnings factor in my trades? So, I what I don't wanna do is take a trade into um, a known disruption, known um, news that could move the price uh, in an unexpected way. You know, we don't know what earnings are going to be, and we don't know how people will, re will respond to it. So we don't want to trade into potential volatility. So uh, if I'm in a trade, I'll typically scale out and, and uh, reduce the position size. If we're in a good trend, I don't want to exit it and give it all away, but I'll, I'll try to lock in some profit, reduce risk. If we've got earnings coming up in the next few days, we don't, we don't take a trade into that. We wait until afterwards. John, you're welcome. Hey, so I wanna, I wanna go ahead and wrap up here, and I wanna um, um, review. So I think these three things are essential to your trading, right? You gotta have great trade setups. You gotta have an edge, high probability outcome. You gotta manage risk, you gotta manage your trades. You guys agree? Everybody's here, do you, do you agree? You got that little raise your hand button. Do you believe having these three things will make you a profitable trader if you really truly have them? Got lots of hands going up, absolutely. Right? It just makes sense. It's logical. Absolutely. All right, cool. Thank you. I'm lowering the hands now. So how many of you are excited about some of the trades that we just looked at? Um, you know, we looked at some precious metal trades that have some real promise. Uh, we didn't find too many interesting ones on the financial scale, although we got, I got Citibank in play, right? And then, uh, there's a few more like GE that look like they could be going counter trend and maybe taken off, right? Alice is very interested. Yeah, good. But maybe you feel like this guy here, like, man, that was a ton of information. Uh, I didn't catch it all, right? <laughs> what I'd like to do, if it's okay, I'd spend a few minutes and just go over a, an offer, how you can participate in uh, trades like this with me. All the stuff we just talked about. So, I do run a stock pick service, right? I, I have signals where I send out stock picks on the trades that I'm taking in my own account. And let me show you how that works, what it looks like on a, on a website, on my website. So here's followingtrades.com. As a subscriber, people log in. And you've got your email, you've got your password. And if you're a subscriber to the stock and options picks, you come in here to this detail section and I've recorded a video once a week with a review of all the charts and anything we're changing, whether it still makes sense to get in. There's a calculator embedded so you can calculate your position size. Um, you, you, know, you enter the current price, you enter your account size and it will calculate um, how many shares are appropriate for that account size following my risk management guidelines. And it also tells you the current reward to risk uh, of that trade, whether it still makes sense to get in, so I provide those tools. And then here's a, a detail of every single trade that we got open, right? So Citibank, you know, it's a short trade, our stop is currently at this price, the target set at this price, here's the contract if you want to trade it, and then a chronology of the trade, we got in at what price, right? So every trade we, we provide all this, you can see like tandem is one we're in, right? Here's the entry, and we move the stop, we took profit, Right. By the way, this one's at over 50% profit, so it's an awesome trade. So this is the kind of information when, when there's a new trade, you get um, 
We're posting email and a text alert if you'd like to opt into that. Every Wednesday we have a, uh, a live chat session and we record those if you can't make it. So like you see last Wednesday we recorded a live chat session. Um, so for the stock pick service, you get great winning trades, the same ones I'm taking in my own account, my own money, posted on my website. You get you know the stop, the entry, the target price. You get an option contract if you want to trade it that way. You get alerts if there's changes. We're going to move the stop. We're going to take profit. We're going to close the trade. You get an alert if there's a new trade. You get a Wednesday night chat session. And if you sign up for the uh, uh, stock and option picks, you get a uh, consultation, one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. So, um, you know, what, what's this really worth? You know, uh, over time, the winning picks, if you had a $100,000 account, it's returning on average about $1,900 per month. Um, you, know, you get four hours of detailed trade consultation in the Wednesday night sessions. You know, if you're to go buy that, you know, from a, a, a top tier educator, you know, or a mentor, that's about 1200 bucks worth of consultation that's included, right? You get one on one consultation. Again, top tier uh, educators are, we're, we're charging about a thousand bucks an hour for one on one consultation education because each session, you, we I answer questions and, and provide education and you know advanced option techniques and trade analysis and all this kind of stuff. So you know add all that, it's about fifty three hundred bucks. And I'm going to offer you all of this: great trade setups, great risk management, trade management for real trades that I'm taking. You're going to get four hours of detailed trade consultation per month in a in a live chat session. You're going to get one on one consultation. You're going to get ongoing education. You're going to get access to and help with winning trades. And it's not going to cost you fifty-three hundred bucks. You can uh, you can try it for thirty days for thirty-seven dollars, and that's a hundred percent money-back guarantee. And let me get you the link for that. And I post it in the chat box, so you can try the stock and option fix service for thirty days for thirty-seven dollars. See if it's a good fit for you. Check it out. Participate in a few trades, a few calls and then see if it's a good fit. Um, oh, there, Eva got it. She is here, she's on it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then after the 30 days, it's gonna renew at $97 per month, which is a discount. The list price on the homepage of my website is 127. So you try it for 30 days for $37. You got a money back guarantee. If it's not a good fit, just send me an email, give us a call. No questions asked, no hard feelings, we'll refund your money. So it's, it's very low risk. After the 30 days, you're like, yeah, I want to stay. Um, go ahead and, and you let it renew. It will automatically renew at $97 per month, and you'll have access as long as you have a current subscription. There is no commitment. It is month to month. You know, anytime you decide you know, you're going to go traveling or whatever, you, you can just cancel, right? No hard feelings, no questions asked, right? And again, when you sign up, you have the... Uh, you're invited to set up an initial one-on-one -on -one consultation with me so we can get off to a really good start, get to know you, answer any questions, all that kind of stuff. So go ahead and click that link. If you want to find out more, go ahead and sign up. And I'm gonna go ahead and hang out here online and just answer any questions that you have about this service. So I'm gonna stop the recording now. And uh, uh, just hang out here and like I said, uh, answer any questions you have about the, uh, the service. But thanks so much for uh, showing up. I enjoyed this, We've, we had fun, I had fun looking at charts and ideas and, and walking through the information. So thank you very much.